Hello, everybody. Welcome to day three of Don't Shoot Portland's Black Lives Matter, Not Black Friday panel. My name is Ty. I am the board president of Don't Shoot Portland, a social justice nonprofit focused on civic engagement and legal advocacy and uh, community empowerment through arts and education. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about uh, what the hell is CRT, critical race theory. I think with, um, you know, it's an extremely very topical uh, topic, and I think everyone here will have a lot to say about it. We're joined by Ashley Albies of Albies and Stark and National Lawyers Guild, as well as Juan Chavez, who is with OJRC. Um, and I'm with Karen Hsu from Omnivore, who is a designer and actually created our activity for today. So thank you all for joining us. And um, I'm excited to have Teresa in conversation with you all. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and then um, share a video that I think is gonna lead us into what we're gonna discuss today. So thank you all for joining us today. Hello. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Um, so Trust every day. There, there was no sound. I didn't hear any sound on that. I don't know if you were intending. Oh, you didn't? Oh, Ty had it. Hold on. Ty had it muted. So I'm going to replay it. I'm sorry. Okay. No um, technical difficulties. Technical difficulties. Ty was like, what's going on with it? Um, Everybody is aware of this by now. We kind of have um, technical oh. difficulties sometimes. <laughs> So thanks for supporting, you know, don't shoot. We are very grassroots. Um, this is a new, you know, being a tech coordinator. I've got a lot of, you know, obstacles to overcome, but you know, thanks for being patient with me. Hey, do you want to bring up the- The screen was muted and the text was muted. I know, but do you want to bring up the image that you wanted to- oh, I don't know where you put it. You airdropped it somewhere. Okay, so. We're just gonna carry on with our presentation today. Um, sorry, <laughs> hopefully we can just be better in the future, but don't know where it went. It disappeared into the desktop, so. Sorry, y'all, let me uh, stop sharing my screen again. How do I stop the share or have I stopped You're it? You're not sharing. Okay, good deal. All right, so sorry about that. Um, so every day I've played a video that I found on TikTok because a lot of people, are doing a lot of activism online. And I've found different um, aspects of what I wake up and see on my For You page that are considerate to this week's panels. And the one that I had found that you haven't seen, um, it was mostly about the savagery and the violence in the holiday that we call Thanksgiving. Um, and it was kind of formulating some kind of consciousness uh, using rap and imaging. And so um, I'll share it in the link uh, for those of us who haven't been able to check it out. But yeah, obviously what Ty was talking about and what you can see behind me is we just heard the guilty verdicts in the malice and murder um, trial for the Mick Michaels and, and Brian, um, you know, people who killed um, Ahmad Aubrey last year in February on the 23rd of 2020 um, have sought and, and have gotten justice in this injustice system. And one of the things that um, kind of that I felt and that I understood in this is that had it not been for the outrage of community, had it not been for the uprising and protest, that we might not have had the outcome in that courtroom that we all witnessed today. And there is still another trial that should be happening in February that is going to be uh, focused on the federal hate crime. And um, we'll see what happens. You know, we didn't get any major bills passed that protect the lives of Black people in this country or dealt with the fact that there are still lynchings happening in this country. 
Um, and so a lot of us, though that outcome happened, um, it doesn't make the thought that your child taking a run through your neighborhood or going to a store or running around and playing in a park with toys, um, that they're not going to be murdered. Um, we don't we we wish that these type of outcomes could give us that kind of favor, um, but we still live in America and this world is not built that way yet. And so um, it's mindful for people like myself, community organizers, that there are assets, um, even though, you know, we can't always hope that the justice system is going to fulfill our hopes. But there are assets in the educational models and in the understanding of policy and the more we understand um, and that we share, the more we can do with what we have. And so I'm excited today. I wanted to start off with just letting you all know that I didn't bring in the guests today because they're professionals in CRT. I brought them in because they're professionals that showing up for community, um, whether it's through their art, whether it's through their legal skills, whether it's through their uh, maybe photography and note taking their protest. Um, but that determination, that self-conscious determination to be there where people need you um, at a time where we're all working hard to make the world a better place, um, it's important to see who those people are because a lot of times, we're challenged with only seeing um, the faces that have the loudest voices. And so we lose the consciousness that we matter in all of this, that there is something that we can actually do, whether we're the ones making the judgments or sitting on the jury um, or showing up at protests, there's still a lot of work that every individual in society can do. And so these are people that I count on in society um, to do the work that I do. <laughs> And so I wanted to have y'all here today. And so I'm gonna just go ahead and go down the line and let everybody introduce themselves before we start into the uh, project that we have because we are gonna be doing something with Omnivore which is a CRT activity. And I'm excited for my friends that are lawyers to participate in. It's not that I think y'all are professionals but just because I think that from what I've heard in the conferences that I've watched online um, most of the people in the industry of, of social change, and I have to call it an industry because it's becoming one, um, they're wondering how to get information out to the people. And they're always saying that people need to have these discussions, that we have to know that these conversations matter. And so, yeah, I'm bringing it up. So I'm going to start in, in the alphabet. So Ashley um, Alves is a really good friend, an attorney that I've been working with for several years. And Ashley, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and talk about your work. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Thanks, Teresa. And thank you to Don't Shoot for all the work that y'all are doing out in the community and, and giving um, just some really good guidance and um, outlines of how and where anybody who's got any kind of skills at all or none at all can fit in in some way to um, pushing for social change and, and supporting that. And, uh, you know, I think it's really important the artistic piece. Um, that don't shoot engages with people because for me, like art to me helps helps look inward and focus on some internal changes as well as some external changes. Um, so, like Teresa said, my name is Ashley Alves. I use she her pronouns. I have been a practicing attorney here in Portland for about sixteen years. Um, I currently um, am a partner in in a small practice, Alves and Stark, along with Whitney. Um, Whitney Stark is my law partner, Maya Rinta is another attorney in our office, Lisa Boucher is our paralegal, and then we have some wonderful law clerks. So pretty small operation, but I have had the benefit to have Don't Shoot as a client in the protest litigation that arose in the, um, in the wake of the George Floyd protests after his murder. Um, and have had the opportunity to work on some really wonderful political cases. Um, and I think that plays into the discussion that we're gonna have here today. Um, I do police misconduct and government misconduct, but I also litigate a lot of employment discrimination, in particular race discrimination cases. Um, so I, there's a direct line to, from critical race theory to, to think and understand the way that um, the legal frameworks, both the criminal legal system and the civil legal system perpetuate these inequalities that we see over and over and over. And that the system, I agree with Teresa, sometimes we can see justice and what justice looks like to the system, but more often than not, we don't see that. Um, and so I think that it's a multifaceted and complicated and nuanced discussion and also one that we should and could be having. And I'm excited that people are having these discussions more so than they were when I was in law school, it feels like. 
Thank you so much, Ashley. And Juan, you go next. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And I just, uh, I'll echo Ashley and my love and admiration for Don't Shoot. Um, and, and also gonna highlight your um, intersection with the, uh, the art world. Don't sleep on a, on a Don't Shoot art exhibit. Uh, There's a beautiful one uh, downtown. I forgot the gallery's name, but it was, uh, it was both a, a powerful bit of art and also history that um, is sorely lacking in the city. So I'm, I'm deeply appreciative. Um, my name is Juan Chavez, I use he, him pronouns. I'm the uh, director of the Civil Rights Project at the Oregon Justice Resource Center. I work with some incredible legal workers, uh, lawyers, legal assistants, prison house lawyers. Um, and uh, our goal is to end mass incarceration. Um, and uh, that's proving to be a, a difficult task, but it's one that we're motivated to, to working on. And uh, I've worked with uh, both Teresa and, uh, and Ashley on police accountability cases. Um, I'd say that most of the, uh, what, what, what our work does try to focus on more, uh, primarily is, is prison law as well. And uh, certainly the, 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 you, you, you don't see a starker, image of um, the way that we have institutionalized and constructed the machinery of, of uh, racial oppression, of, all, of uh, the oppression of all folks who, who dare to challenge uh, that system of oppression um, than in our prisons. So happy to, happy to be here. I'm happy that you are. And uh, Karen, if you would, wouldn't mind introducing yourself, Hi, I'm Karen Chu. Um, I'm a graphic designer. Um, I'm a, a mother. I, um, you know, have been um, part of the studio Omnivore um, since 2002. So my partners are actually um, Alice Chung in Brooklyn, New York, and Julie Cho in Los Angeles. Um, and we've been working with Teresa and Ty um, for a few years now. Um, I feel really grateful to be able to help um you know design is really and we we see it as an act of translation and you know it's image and text and meaning and it can't exist without a message um anyway um thank you thank you karen and i i wanted to start off this program with the uh, um what an activity that Karen put together for us, because as Juan mentioned, we had an art installation at Holding Contemporary in downtown Portland off of 9th and Flanders. And it was focused on 1940s petition that basically um, was petitioning the city um, to not allow black people, Negroes as they called it in the petition to settle in the Albina neighborhood. And in looking at that petition and other maps and documents that we added to the installation for context, um, Karen actually put together this document for us uh, with the help of a CRT and worked with some other people to kind of build in that explanation because in addition to the art installation and the videos and the books that we put there, um, the thing that Don't Shoot Portland does when we put our art installations together is we hope that we're building a community art project that is also an action plan. And so uh, putting all these different parts together should help us figure out ways to go back into society after working within that art um, and, and having that what to do for ourselves. Uh, I, I can't tell people what to do in response to you know how to show up for Black Lives but some people just know that whatever they know is the right thing to do, it's always the right time to do it. And Karen is one of those people. And so I'm very excited um, about sharing today's um, activity that we're gonna do before our discussion, because I hope it gets us thinking and I hope it gets us researching. And then I hope that that thinking and researching becomes action because we are uh, seeing right now that it is possible to make social change. So. Uh, Karen, I'll let you share your screen. And Ty, is Karen a co-host on here? No, you have to be. Okay, let me see how I do that. Um, and I'll let Ty do that for me because maybe I don't know. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right, thank y'all for being patient with us today. <laughs> 
And that should be good. All right, so Karen, you should be good. Okay, do you see my screen? Okay. Yep. Okay. And you don't see like my text messages, <laughs> my other <laughs> like desktop <laughs> um, randomness. Um, okay, so. Um, let me just, okay. Okay, so um, I had a little bit of a quick introduction before, but I'll just kind of go with the script. Um, I'm, I'm one third of a small design studio called Omnivore. Together with my studio partners, Alice Chung and Julie Cho, we've been collaborating with Holding Contemporary, run by our friends, Iris Williamson and Tiffany Harker. Their friend, Derek Franklin, connected them with Teresa Rayford and Ty Carpenter of Don't Shoot Portland, and that's how we met. Um, as you might know, Don't Shoot's installation at the Holding Space Bridge Community and Art. We're really grateful to create digital and print ephemera with them. In August, Don't Shoot held its third exhibition at Holding, centered on education, documentation, and preservation of history. A partnership with the City of Portland Archives yielded documents that informed current systems, such as a 192 page petition against a black settlement in the Albina neighborhood submitted to the Housing Authority of Portland in 1943, which Teresa and Ty envisioned as writing on the walls, wallpapering the gallery. After seeing the proof of these documents and feeling the growing sensationalism around critical race theory across the country, we created a booklet that tried to summarize key points and direct the reader to books and articles where they could educate themselves. Each um, simplified concept expanding in detail through quoted texts. The booklet was designed to create layers of information to point the viewer where they could read more. There were a lot of articles and books from which to extract and it was daunting to try to summarize such a complex and changing body of ideas. The process was, what, was one of learning. By reading more, I discovered my own misunderstandings about critical race theory. It became clear how much confusion there is. In our research and reading, we found a Reuters Ipsos poll conducted in July 2021. We weren't surprised with the poll results. For this survey, a sample of 1,004 adults aged 18 plus from the continental US, Alaska, and Hawaii was interviewed online in English. The poll has a credibility interval plus or minus 3.5 percentage points for all respondents. Today, we'll ask seven true or false questions from the poll. <clears throat> Number one, are the following statements about critical race theory true or false? CRT is taught in most public high schools. And then I'll just keep going. And we're, in, and, and we're encouraging you to write down your answers because at the end of this conversation, we're gonna show you the results. Yeah. Uh, number two, are the following statements about critical race theory true or false? CRT was first established 40 years ago. Three, CRT says that individual acts or laws are unlikely to change systems that were founded with racist principles. Four, CRT, CRT says that many American institutions are founded on racist principles. Five, CRT says that many American institutions are set up to favor white Americans. Six, CRT says that discriminating against white people is the only way to achieve equality. Seven, CRT says that white people are inherently bad or evil. And those are the questions. Um, we can also post uh, in the chat a link to the original um, survey report, but maybe at the end. <laughs> 
Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Karen. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so hopefully people were able to uh, follow along and write down your answers because at the end, we're going to go through and show you the responses. But Karen, did you want to tell us a little bit more about that poll, um, where people can find that information and, and different things? Yeah, yeah. It's um, So we found it through, um, it's, I have the link. I could I can give the link, but the link will have all the results. <laughs> so do you want me to send it at the oh, end absolutely. in the chat? And we'll, it, and we'll make sure to put it in the YouTube yeah. as well. So hopefully people uh, listened along with us and, and were able to, to follow along with that. And thank you so much for putting that together. It's like we're extending that installation and we do plan to work that theme into our upcoming MLK March. So there's more to come. Um, so first of all, I wanted to ask everybody, obviously, um, the question that's on all of our minds, hopefully, um, but how do you feel about the trial of Ahmed Aubrey and the outcome that we all heard today? I know that, you know, the other day my phone was ringing off the hook because people wanted to know how we felt about what happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, but I think I was mostly focused on what's going on in Georgia and for good reason. And so I'll start with Ashley, if you don't mind sharing your thoughts. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it, I honestly, I felt relief. Um, I have really mixed feelings about the criminal legal system. I mean, I think as a tool for accountability, it has failed. It's been weaponized against black people and people of color in this country. And um, at the same time, you know, these are people that took a life and should be held accountable in some way. And the current criminal legal system, I think, for the crime that they committed is what we have. Um, and so there was relief um, was my first reaction. And, you know, it, it's also deeply saddened because it will never bring Ahmed Aubrey back to have those people in jail. Um, I think it's important to separate them from society from causing more harm. And, um, you know, I want them to be accountable for what they've done in the life that they've taken. Um, so that was kind of my, my primary feeling. And then the, the second feeling, you know, like juxtaposed against the Rittenhouse verdict too. And, you know, Teresa, I know you and I had talked and, and you were following both trials fairly closely. And I had watched the Rittenhouse trial more um, just because of my capacity to watch it and, the, and my schedule at the time. <laughs> And um, that kids there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the written house trial was really difficult to watch because the way the judge was behaving um, and some of the rulings that the court had made and um, that felt really unfair and harmful and inconsistent with what, you know, I'm not a criminal defense lawyer. Um, I mostly do civil work, but very inconsistent with what I've seen in other criminal defense trials and what I've come to understand about the way many, the, some of the rulings that um, many criminal defense attorneys have received um, in terms of their client, particularly if their client is a person of color or a black person. And so that was very clear to me with the Rittenhouse um, verdict and it, it didn't quite surprise me. Um, it angered me and I felt very frustrated um, but to me, hearing today, there was this sense of relief. Um, and, and contrasting it with the Rittenhouse trial, there's, you know, a, again, an escalated sense of anger and frustration at how this whole system is completely unfair. For myself, when I was watching it, and then I saw the outcome, and then I realized the outcome, I thought about when Trayvon Martin was murdered, and how when we protested for him, how we brought up the Castle Doctrine, the fact that we had that here in Oregon, a stand your ground law. And then I brought it up to leaders as I was organizing and I said, well, why isn't that law used for black people? I was like, there's so many, when I read the law, it basically says that, you know, um, you have the right to defend yourself if you feel like you're about to be harmed or if, you know, your life is being threatened. And I thought about all these kids I know that died in gun violence or in violence that they were considered gangs and all this other stuff. And I was like, what? It, it wasn't applied there and it wasn't applied towards domestic violence. And it wasn't you know, applied when someone was like defending themselves against a, a racist person or you know, at any time was it used to, to support um, the safety of people that were vulnerable. 
And so when I saw that it worked for uh, Kyle, and I know that right now we're in a, 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 what do we call it? A society where there is this energy of uprising. I thought, oh, this is going to flip some stuff. This is going to have the counter narrative. Like they think that organizers and protesters are interested in, you know, protesting against Kyle Redenhouse. But what we really understood at that point was now on the record, there is this president for self-defense and we've never been allowed um, to utilize it because of racism and how stark that is and how it treats us in courtrooms. But because of the uprising work that's continuous, maybe we can try it. <laughs> you know, maybe we can use um, that, that petition now to kind of dismantle some of the issues that have happened to us that have been so harmful. There's people that I know that have been in jail for, you know, killing people that were harming them, that were abusing them. Um, and hopefully now because of, you know, how white supremacy works in this country, um, I don't know, I, I'm hoping I don't have too much hope, but what do you think about the fact that now uh, civil rights attorneys, criminal attorneys, people are gonna be able to utilize what happened in Kenosha um, to probably, you know, uh, bring appeals forth for clients that have been unjustly, and I would say unjustly because if self-defense is a thing, um, they've been incarcerated, you know, some people have already been executed, um, but what do we do going forward with this newfound opportunity? Is it an opportunity? And that's just all a question, so. Yeah, I'm, cu I'm curious to hear, Juan, what your thoughts are on that, because very loud here. <laughs> Number one, but also because I think like there is um, the the legal system at every in the criminal legal system in particular at every stage the, the court makes a ruling on what type of evidence can come in, what kind of evidence stands out, what type of um, legal theories that the parties can put forth, and if the court um, in the Rittenhouse case treated most defendants like Kyle Rittenhouse was treated, we would have a very different legal system. But that's not the case, right? He got the benefit of every doubt. He got the benefit of many rulings. And again, like my understanding, having watched criminal trials and, and you know, talking with colleagues that have litigated those, you know, it's just a different, this, the way that the Rittenhouse case went. I would love if all defendants were treated that way, but they're not. And so that is, was really stark in that case to me. But Mon, I want to, I really want to hear what you have to say. Too. No, uh, <laughs> I want to hear from one as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, I think um, kind of across the, the spectrum politically I, uh, with criminal defense lawyers, civil rights lawyers, you know, all sorts of varying uh, uh, political opinions, but I think everybody agrees that this only, the Rittenhouse verdict happened because they took it to trial. How many folks don't take their cases to trial? In fact, this whole system would break if people didn't plea out 98% uh, of the time, I think it's the statistic that's thrown out. Um, and in part, I mean, that's because Rittenhouse was given every opportunity to have a well-funded, thorough defense. Um, also coupling that with what I think was a rather poor prosecution of the matter. Um, I, I think it was uh, Bree Neeson Bass who, who was talking about the Rittenhouse decision as being in a way um, almost inconsequential, at least the result in it, in the sense that, you know, this very well could have gone the other way, but the white supremacist structure of these courts will persist and will continue to harm uh, people who aren't Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, and, uh, it, it, and so that underpinning would remain guilty or not. Um, and it shouldn't be this arbitrary. I mean, we shouldn't feel this kind of, uh, of relief to know that Ahmed Ivory, you know, his murderers were found to in fact have, have committed the crime that we all know they did. Um, I, don't, I don't have any hope for the prison carceral system to imprison the racism out of these three defendants. It won't save the next Ahmed, unfortunately. Um, but I think there is power in being able to hold a trial, be able to hold evidence and to have the community say that this, what happened to you was wrong. What happens next, that's on us. I don't think it should be prison. I don't think that 
for anybody. I, I just fundamentally disagree with prison as a remedy to our social ills. Um, but it's still important that people know that the community feels that you have transgressed. And so I, I feel some solace there. Yeah, and I, I noticed that one of the people that was questioned after, um, after the trial said, um, the reason that that happened here is because in this, um, in this area, we uphold the status quo and it would be embarrassing for them to allow this to go forward without a conviction. And I thought to myself, well, that's what we all as organizers are always thinking like, yeah, when we go out there and protest and we bring up all these issues, it's gonna be embarrassing for them to allow these issues to continue going, but they always beat us up and then continue doing it and then call us uh, rude or violent for showing up and speaking up. And so you're right about that. Like it's not gonna get the racism to go away. And I was thinking about that the last couple of days, especially with like everything that's going on in the world. And I was like, what would make this world a better place? And I was thinking if we insistently and consistently fought to be anti-racist, because that seems to be our biggest issue um, is that we prefer to have it as a, a tool to keep order and it's not okay. Um, we can live without it. I think we as a society can thrive without it. Um, and I'm talking about racism and I don't wanna even call inequities inequities anymore. I think everything is now just racism. We now have a new definition for probably hundreds of words that we always use, but we never allow the reality of racism to be censored um, when we speak. And so that's why, again, it's so important to me that we start communicating with communities about CRT is that, you know, really the application of language and how we use it. Um, Juan, I wanted to ask you, how did you feel about the outcome? I know that you just told us, you know, <laughs> how you feel it's going to help us challenge the system going forward. But how did you feel watching these trials? Um, was there anything that you were learning? Or, I mean, we, when I saw what was happening in Kenosha, I kept on thinking about all those black and white movies that I watched as a kid, How to Kill a Mockingbird, you know, like all these different movies. And I was like, how are they getting away with that in 2021? Like they don't even care. And, you know, again, <laughs> that whole red, what do you call it? Rose colored glasses that people wear when we talk about America and freedom and liberty and all these different things. Like we really believe the lie, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How did you feel like, what did it mean to you for everything to happen the way that it did? Your thoughts? Oh no, I mean, <laughs> The, the sense of, of, of gratitude that I'm feeling, you know, perhaps it's unearned uh, in the sense that, you know, the, this is, we've all seen the system do what it does to the vast majority of people. So why am I suddenly applauding it? Um, I, I have to imagine that, you know, certainly Ashley and I went through several years of, uh, of, uh, of a, a type of legal education that in, reinforces the view that this is how things are and how things are done. Um, and we've continued to, to build our practices within that system. Um, and so, of course, you know, we would sense some bit of relief in all this. It's kind of remarkable, I think, that we've seen the Chauvin trial, we've seen the Rittenhouse trial, We've seen this trial, and there's also another verdict that came down earlier this week um, in Charlottesville. Um, some community folks sued Richard Spencer, um, uh, Kessler, I forget his first name, uh, and basically all of the, uh, the right-wing groups and won uh, to the tune of 20 plus million dollars. And um, we have evidence that they have blatantly broken the law on so many fronts and still somehow uh, you get you get verdicts like the Rittenhouse verdict where um, you know maybe not every victim had a plausible claim for for murder but gosh there are still dead people you know and, and there is blood on the hands of, of Rittenhouse um, and he now gets to walk away with a you know a congressional externship so I I uh, I, I, I think, and, and this maybe ties into the larger uh, CRT discussion, but what we have seen is, again, this, this revanchist uh, reaction 
to uh, people of color and, and, and allies um, making some potentially some, some gains in the culture in the last couple of years. Um, you know, like him or not, um, we had a black president for eight years and this is how they've reacted. Uh, it, it's, not, uh, it's not subtle. Um, and so the Rittenhouse verdict plays into that. It's like a response and retaliation. I was gonna say, do you think that having the black president and the consciousness of uh, black leadership for eight years um, got us to the type of verdicts that we're getting today? Um, not, let's say not the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, verdict, but let's say what happened in Georgia and what happened with the Unite the Right. Do you think that that was because of uh, black leadership in this country? Or do you think that it had a lot to do with the protests, the ongoing uh, movements towards uh, liberation and community involvement? Because we've witnessed that at least um, the last six years of, of Obama's administration and all into the Trump administration consistently. Um, what are your thoughts about how those how that evolution happens? Because you have one part of the world saying, wait, 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 we're going to elect leaders, they're going to do the right thing, and then everything's going to get better. And then you have another part of the world that's saying, I'll never get my child back, I have nothing to lose, and I'm going to burn this shit down. And we're determined um, in that faction, which side do you think has gotten us? Um, and that's probably unfair, right? Because it takes all of us together. I'm always saying that kind of stuff. But <laughs> what are your thoughts? <laughs> like, was it the status quo that finally listened to us and got us here? Or was it these grieving families and their allies um, working, you know, consistently to get us here? Or do you think it was all of us together? And then if it was, how do we continue moving forward? Um, but so I, you know, that's a good question. Like, I, I think it, it's both because I think you have, um, you know, if you going back to the critical race theory, right? Like if you're looking at these structures and identifying the ways that structurally they embed white supremacy, they embed racism, then you have to like, you know, then you have to recognize the whole system is like fundamentally flawed, right? So black president or not, they're still with operating within this system that is really inherently built on these structures. Um, and there's only so much change you can do within that. That said, um, you know, we saw advancements on, on certain fronts um, in terms of queer rights and trans rights, right? And those were then had a backlash as well. And so I think if you have receptive ears in positions of power, you can advance certain um, rights or certain, um, you know, expand those rights, which is kind of a, a, a frustrating way to have to frame it in the first place. Um, but I think at the core, it's the organizing work of folks on the ground and folks that are impacted, it's working to elevate their voices, working to be really clear. Um, and I think that works in conjunction with having more Black faces in positions of power because there are still a lot of people in this country of all um, racial backgrounds that have come up within the system and see it in a certain way. We're, we're fed this myth of the meritocracy. And so I think that people, it, they're all stages and they're all part of that process. And so I think that the, the core organizing work of folks on the ground and folks working with families who have lost loved ones and elevating those voices and giving forth a critique that again, like is, is within the legacy of critical race theory and within that framework, um, whether you call it that or not, but that looks at these structures and says, these are the problems and this is how it impacts individuals. Right, and it's that conjunction of bringing the theory with with the reality of how it's impacting people on a daily basis. When we look at mass incarceration, or we look at um, you know elevated um, rates of police murder among Black men, like those are the ways that critical race theory kind of identifies the the design flaws with the system, and then people's personal lived experiences, and reaching out and having interpersonal connections, and doing the organizing work on the ground is where we advance that conversation and the movement forward. So I think it's both, but I do, you know, for me, I feel more, I have been moved more by organizing and folks that have been directly impacted who have given me grace as I'm trying to 
navigate these processes. And I agree with Juan, like we came, we learned this system and we came up through the system as trained attorneys. And we're constantly interfacing in, in ways that are so unfair and so problematic. And yet it is the only legal system by which we can get certain remedies for our clients. And so we are in that system. And so I think it's, you know, working with um, organizations like Don't Shoot are, are really just the, the and some of my clients that are so creative in their approach, they refuse to accept kind of the, the general conventions of how this system is supposed to work and come up with really creative and boundary pushing ideas that then Juan and I get to litigate um, and bring those voices and those perspectives into legal spaces that has historically excluded those, those voices and those ideas. Um, so I do think, you know, it's the organizing work, but I think that there is a more receptive place within those systems when we have, you know, have had a black president um, because that, you know, like or not does um, have allow white people, not only white people, but white people in positions of power to understand and self-reflect a little bit more than I think they otherwise would have. Ashley, I'm wondering if you can maybe speak to also maybe what activism or even or or leadership has done to maybe change jury pools um, in understanding these these issues. Do you think it's had any impact there? I'm thinking of like uh, your your PPS case or um, the uh, or the Hayes case. Yeah, I I mean I think that um, black like the Black Lives Matter movement for me as a civil litigator litigating race discrimination cases gave me a shortcut to talk about these, you know, legacy issues or, or really um, long-term and structural issues. Like I can talk to a jury now and say, who here has strong feelings one way or another about the Black Lives Matter movement? Show of hands, right? And then get people to talk about what does that mean to them? Because I want to find out someone who's, I want someone who's going to talk about why they don't think that movement has validity because I don't want them on the jury, right? It's a shortcut to get to some of these racist tendencies and um, thoughts and behaviors that juries have because they're going to be deciding the fate of my clients, right? And so I do think the organizing work, the mass mobilization, um, the Black Lives Matter movement and other social justice and um, movements, Me Too movements, right? It gives us as attorneys a short hand for talking to juries about some of these issues. Um, and, and I do think that, you know, in the, in I had a case against Portland Public Schools a couple of years ago, Teresa, you were there for that. Um, we had a potential juror, a white woman who's, who, you know, raised her hand and said, I just think it's awful that they um, took that young man into custody um, who shot up a church in, in the South. And yet, you know, police are out here killing black men for nothing. And it was not the response that I ex um, had expected. And I think 10 years ago, it would have taken me hours to get to that conversation, to get to that understanding what, about that person's perspective. Um, so I do think that it has um, given us a short cut to get to talk to people about their attitudes. And then there's other strategies to ask questions about the underlying beliefs. But um, um, I do think that has absolutely impacted how jurors that I've talked to about racism and how it manifests itself. I think the organizing work on the ground has really challenged people to look internally and think about that more deeply. And I think you're right, because I remember in 2014, um, during the time that we were protesting for Ferguson, that no one really believed that a jury would side with us as activists. And even when I was, you know, going up against, um, you know, the city of Portland, because I was arrested, um, you know, and I was like, oh, you know, they're violating my civil liberties. This should be civil rights. You know, like I need, I don't need criminal defense. I need a civil rights attorney. And my attorney was like, nah, if we go to the federal courthouse, they're going to look at you and you're going to be in jail and you don't want to do time. So we went to the district courts and I was like, wow. But as a community organizer, what I thought about was more people in our communities, like you said, need to know about this movement. They need to know about the work that we're doing um, outside of the protests so that they can become allies, even if they don't believe that they're allies, even if they're like, oh, I'm not a protester and I don't have a Black Lives Matter sign in my yard, understanding the complications of how race um, creates, you know, 
this this tool or this mandate against someone's civil liberties or rights, um, it's important for us all to understand that we saw what that kind of outcome could could do for us. What Ahmad Aubrey, I'm sure that was a fully almost white, you know, fully white jury. And the fact that they were able to think critically and to kind of put themselves in that position, like, wait a minute, I think it had that happened three or four years ago, they would have been like, yeah, he was running. Because we always saw that like running was a crime that you could commit and be murdered for and people would say you shouldn't have run. And now it's like, wait a minute, why were you even trying to stop this person from running? This person is supposed to be robbing the house. They don't have a bag. They're not running around with a backpack. Why am I mad at this person? Oh, because it's a black person in my neighborhood. And we have to understand that that's something that um, when we're talking about thinking critically or you know putting yourself in someone else's shoes, it's a serious situation when we're talking about human rights. <laughs> so um, Juan, I wanted to ask you, can you answer that same question? Like, how do you feel the impact of community engagement, like let's say 10 years down the line, because a lot of people want to see an immediate response or immediate change. And I noticed that when Kyle Rittenhouse was, you know, free, when the verdict came out as not guilty, people were like, wow, this is a message to America that people can just kill us in the streets. And this is a message that if we show up for Black Lives Matter, that someone can do something to us. And I'm like, hey, that's been happening since the beginning of time. Like people were getting lynched, people were getting shot, people were being chased down, we're still being harmed. Like that trial and the fact that he was able to kill, you know, those people while they were, you know, showing up at this protest or engaged in any of this, that is what we're out there for. It's not that that didn't happen and then it happened and now the world has to stand back and disengage from the movement. The entire movement is predicated on the fact that we are being murdered in the streets, um, you know, by vindictive people, sometimes with bias and racism or, you know, we have Karens that know their power. They know they can call the police on us at any time, our children at any time and possibly witness a murder um, by the state on us for their discomfort. Um, what do you see in the next 10 years? What do you think? as someone who's in this, uh, what, what do families and communities and people organizing, what should we be doing in order to make this sustainable? If that's the question, I'm hoping that's my question. I have so many. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, uh, in 10 years, um, gosh, I mean, I hope we make it, but <laughs> um, we, got, we got so many crises on our hands. I, I think if there's anything to the American spirit, it's uh, waiting to the last minute to fix a problem. So <laughs> maybe the crisis will will force us to 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 engage with this. I um, I think the Rittenhouse verdict. I, I I think it's incredible how many cases about white supremacy were going on in November. Um, and I think the overall picture people have to walk away with is, you know, it's not necessarily a game of chance. This is just the system that is built to ensure outcomes that don't rock the status quo. Uh, Unite the Right, you know, it's an incredible verdict and it will, as we saw with the, the verdict against um, the, the founder of war um, out of the uh, Mulligata Sara murder, uh, that devastated war doesn't mean that other white Aryan uh, organizations weren't going to show up to fill in the neo-Nazi void, but these things do have lasting impacts and there are still wins, there are, uh, wins to be achieved uh, through the court system. Um, but what that means for, I think, people on the ground is this work's not done. It's never been done. I mean, how many iterations of mass movements have we seen in just the last decade? I thought it was incredible to watch the gains of Occupy go into the movement for Black Lives, to go into um, uh, anti-Trump rallies, to go into anti-fascist rallies, to go into um, uh, the movement for Black Lives in 2020. Um, that all built on each other. It was all iterative. And I, I have no no doubt that the people who were shot at, gassed, and beaten last year won't give up. I think it's important that we recognize we all have physical limits. We all have um, 
truly a, um, a point of diminishing returns maybe in our ability to go out into the streets. And I mean that entirely personally. I, 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 I could say that I can still go out, but it will require maybe months of, of you, know, you know, for lack of better terms, just like licking my wounds of, you know, post-trauma of listening to flashbangs again. Um, I, it's not to say that I've done my time. It's just that we all have limits. We should all be recognized. We, we should all have some grace with, uh, with each other. We should all raise new people going into the streets to understand that those are the stakes and that it's still important that we go out. You know, it's incredible that so many people did go out last year during a pandemic even. And I think it's because people realized, listen, I'm not gonna die of COVID for my boss, but I will die or I will get COVID. If, if it means going out and getting COVID to defend black lives, I'll do it. And I think that is a powerful uh, thing in a lot of ways. And again, I don't think this movement needs any more martyrs. We need people who will live to see uh, um, the future that we build in the next 10 years. Um, but it's just gonna take a lot of work. Um, and uh, if, if, if you take away anything from these verdicts, it's that. Yesterday, I was talking to someone that we were we were basically saying that the haves and the have nots in our community all showed up together on the front line last year. And now we're all trying to figure out how to build and continue building within our communities without going back to how things were uh, prior to COVID and, you know, the uprising for the life of George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, Elijah McClain, and so many more people. Um, but I'm, I'm always curious because when I was watching this conference the other day uh, by Bernice King, uh, one of the things that she was talking about when she had the people on the panel with her were, um, what really is CRT? You know, she was saying that she went to law school and it never came up. <laughs> and then um, one of the lawyers that was on there said, well, he got into it because he was teaching kids about social justice, but then he started using art to kind of get them to kind of engage in the conversation. And, you know, there's all these different philosophical reasons and thoughts and, and terms. And I wanted to ask both of you just straight up, what does, you know, what the hell is CRT? What is CRT to you? And what do you think we need to know in order to engage in a practice that gets us there? I, I know that people are saying that we're teaching it in schools and educating our little children to hate white people. And you heard the questionnaire by Karen, um, but I don't think that that's what it is. Um, but I would love to hear from you what you believe it is and how you feel it could help us um, undermine a systemic uh, violation of all of our human rights, you know, white supremacy. Just either one of you can ask, hi, baby. <laughs> Your kids are getting big. <laughs> well, um, oh, sure. I'll go. I'll go quickly. Um, I will. I will join uh, uh, the honorable Bernice King in saying I wasn't taught it in law school either. I, I'm struggling to think of that. Those at all possible, but yeah, I, I, I can't recall anybody bringing up critical race theory. So, uh, you know, I, nor do, nor do I think I was ever taught it in any school that I've attended. Um, I think in a lot of ways, people come to critical race theory uh, through other means. And it, it's kind of, I, I might liken it to how I came to prison abolition um, it just seemed bright. I didn't know there was a word for it. It was just, oh, right. Uh, I, I agree with this thing that people have been talk, talking about and developing for decades, um, many black, pr primarily black feminist leaders. Um, and, uh, and, and so critical race theory, I, I, again, I'm not a scholar on it, but my, my lay understanding is that we have built an entire series of institutions, legal, administrative, um, institutional places where the, the white power order uh, will be maintained, will be held, and all things that flow out of it will ensure that that status quo is, is uh, maintained. Um, I mentioned prisons earlier. Um, you know, we're a 
a, a, a very white state, and yet uh, Native folks, uh, Latinx folks, and Black folks are all overly represented in our prison system. And the white power structure that exists in prison is hard to miss. You know, it's it's a place where uh, people fall into gangs, not not for any reason but their own protection. And it's because the institution understands that they can keep people under their thumb if they're more afraid of each other than they are of the guards. And uh, it, it, in and uh, the racism is, is very apparent when you know a certain amount of people are, are put into segregation for longer than other people and when you know challenging the institution is the greatest sin you can commit um so uh, that, that's my understanding i'll let ashley uh, fix anything i said <laughs> well there, fortunately there's nothing to fix i mean i think that you know i agree wholeheartedly with Juan on a lot of us not unusually um you know, I didn't take critical race theory classes or that was not a theme in any of my law school classes. And yet when I did read, when I searched out and read law review articles or it would get incorporated into some of the clinical, more clinical um, uh, spaces that I was in where we were actually providing direct services to clients um, as students or when you know I took an environmental justice class with a practitioner. and. I don't believe that professor used the word critical race theory, but it was inherent in identifying the structures that led to environmental racism and how, um, you know, if like targeting and citing waste facilities or running highways through communities, right, particularly black communities and communities of color that didn't have the political power to stop something like that, but that the rights of those people in those communities to have a clean environment were just completely squashed and squelched. And it, those were legal actions, right? And so um, when I did read about critical race theory, which was an outcropping uh, or, or came after critical legal theory, right? Critical legal studies, I think that's the word, where that looked at um, the ways that the legal system perpetuates poverty, perpetuates um, you know, the, the different power differentials among um, you know, economic and perpetuating economic inequality. Um, and those were just resonant that yes, 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 that makes sense, that makes sense. And it, instead of trying to see the legal system as a justice system, um, once I understood that it was not a justice system, that it was a legal system, and it was deeply flawed at its foundation, it made sense to me. And I could figure out how to work within that system because that's what I've chosen to do in a way that I can identify the ways to help individual people. And I think that's some of the challenges within the legal system is the disaggregation. That one person might have a negative experience and you can try and help that one person. Um, but if you try to say that this applies to everybody with that background, then all of a sudden you get all these walls and you can't advance that legal theory that would help more people without a whole bunch of hurdles because the legal system is set up in a way to make that nearly possible or to throw up as many roadblocks as possible. Um, and so part of what the legal system does really well is disaggregate and pull apart people's lived experiences and saying, well, this is your individual experience, your individual remedy. Whereas um, if there was a broader let, then I think some laws try to widen the realm and the, widen the range of who can be impacted by a particular legal ruling, but for the most part, it really tries to um, individualize and um, disaggregate the harm that people are experiencing en masse by a particular governmental conduct or by corporate conduct that's incredibly irresponsible and damaging. Um, and so for me, critical race theory really gave and under helped me understand the legal system in a way where I could feel um, better equipped to navigate it. So certain battles we will, we will fight and lose and we'll fight those battles anyway. Certain battles we will fight and we will lose and we've decided we talk to our clients that it might not be worth fighting at that moment. Um, but I think it's given me as a civil rights attorney um, a better way to help my clients and the folks that I work with and other lawyers and, and folks in the legal community a better way to understand the structures so that we can figure out how to best use 
our capacity, our skills, um, the, the legal things that we have to try and either drive a wedge in that or stop certain kinds of harm from reoccurring, or to get the, a redress that we can get within the confines of the legal system, if that makes sense. Um, and that's, and all of those points that you made, that's why it's so incredible to me that people are trying to stop people from reading books and learning and like, you know, building up uh, myths about the whole process because it's literally just a human rights, um, you know, focus. I wanted to ask you also, you're involved in a, um, a case right now, or are you working with some clients right now that are trying to fight for their children's education or something to do with CRT, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I work with some teachers who have been targeted um, and this, these are elementary school teachers, right? And they're not teaching critical race theory. They're not, I mean, it is a, you know, it stems from this like J juris, like law school theory, academic, um, you know, and, and I think that that's important, right? The academic piece of it, um, that really critically assesses this, that that seeps um, into other areas of society for sure. But what a lot of elementary schools and, and junior high schools and, and high schools are teaching is history. And they're teaching it in a way that is more accurate than the history that I learned when I was in school. Instead of glossing over Thanksgiving as this peaceful holiday where you know um, indigenous people helped the um, colonists survive, you know, it, it was, it, it's, they're learning a different narrative, a more truthful narrative, an accurate narrative of, of the founding of this country and, and what the repercussions are, right? So when I talk to my kids about Thanksgiving and they say, well, we learned that indigenous people were, you know, um, sharing resources and skills and were made really sick and they had their, their land taken from them and they were kidnapped and um, you know, they have this different understanding of the foundations of this country than I did when I grew up. And that is history. <laughs> that is not critical race theory. I think that the, the um, critical race theory, as, as we know, it's been around for 40 years, that has led to the way that students are being taught in the education system um, has, has course corrected that. I think that's a direct legacy of that, but, but my children aren't learning about the structural um, underpinnings of, of why the educational system or why housing discrimination is, is legal and legitimized. Like they're not learning critical race theory. They're learning a truer history of this country than, than what we've been teaching for the past, you know, however long we've, been, we've had standardized education. Um, and yet there is this right-wing adoption of this narrative. They've been fairly open about using critical race theory as a flashpoint to help organize around um, pushing back against, you know, teaching this truer history and pushing back in ways that um, solidifies and further grounds white supremacy by saying you're teaching real history because you want my white you want my white child to grow up thinking that they're bad because they're white. I mean, it's it is would be ridiculous if it wasn't so diabolical and if there weren't so many people that appear to agree or like feel. Um, compelled to, to agree with that narrative. Um, so it's, uh, and again, like I think in the, um, the, the presentation that Karen had given earlier, you know, there's the discussion about critical race theory. It doesn't mean that teaching white people that they should, that they are racist and that they're inherently bad. It's identifying the structures that lead to continued oppression so that they can dismantle that, right, is the hope. But that um, folks feel so threat white, the, people on the right feel so threatened by the very notion of teaching history that they've had to weaponize this idea of critical race theory and say that they're, you know, try to out and, and successfully outlaw it in some places um, is, is super dangerous and also 100% part of the playbook. Yeah, I mean, when I found out they were trying to remove books like Beloved and the, you know, Ruby Bridges and stuff, I'm like, really? Like, oh my God, what'll happen if we really go back? If you're worried about, you know, books from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you'll really go crazy when we start teaching history from the 1800s. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's just so much going on. And I'm like, we're making all of these strides moving forward, but there is a generation that is doing whatever they can to influence us and keep us in place. 
um, as a society. And I think that the more we move forward, it benefits all of us. I'm, I'm trying to figure out like, what is so scary about, um, you know, about the world changing when we need it to, when our children are dependent on it. And I wanted to show you, I just found that video that we tried to play earlier. And one of the things you said about Thanksgiving is what made me think about it. So let me play that real quick, just to get us into it before Karen comes on for the rest of the program. I have to first find my screen so I can share it again. Okay, da 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 da. I'm getting there, y'all. Acceptable participant screen sharing. Um, okay, so maybe I can't share my screen. Ty? <laughs> so Karen is still the host, I believe. Oh, okay. So Karen, if you're listening. Oh, sorry, you. sorry. Let me oh, get no that. Problem. <laughs> I'm so happy we get to edit these later when we add our captions and stuff, so. <laughs> Yay. All right. So y'all see all of this, but let me just play the video real quick. While you eating your turkey, remember the heard it all the indigenous thoughts that it was innocent. Now we're sitting every year and celebrating some innocence. Teaching all of my children that it was a holy pilgrimage. Now we met at the immigrants, even though we the immigrants. And when I say we, I really mean the one that was still in it. Now we eat it, remember us of the hateful people that was needed, landed the sisters, and then they ended up killing them. We should pray for the hell of it. Now we pray over beans, greens, potatoes, you name it. We need a different arrangement. We need to honor the sacred. We need to honor the natives. Our history so insane, and we know it. Our history so insane, and we know it. <laughs> our history is so insane and we know it okay so yeah we know it we're trying to do something about it um the call to action from dr benice king was for us to do more to engage our communities and to bring it up um what are some things and i'm just going to ask y'all because that was the call to action um that she left out she was like what are ways that we can engage our community that we can make this a uh, topic that we share discuss and we and we create a standard because we know that there's always gonna be resistance to change, but since we're all being educated about it and we know that people are trying to stop it, um, what are some thoughts that you have? I know that one of the things that I've told families is that everything that we teach our children, like with the books that I have behind me, which are books that we give out to kids every year, um, everything doesn't have to be taught in school we can start teaching at home. We can start building within our own businesses uh, mandates for education or opportunities for inclusion or whatever we need to do. But when I was asking you that question about 10 years from now on, um, I'm just thinking that with all of these different things that we're learning that maybe we'll capture them and together we'll make them revolutionary assets and so that's one of the things that I'm looking for now is like, how do we engage this conversation about CRT to the point where it just becomes normal for us to actually aggregate our experiences into um, innovative thinking and moving forward processes. We don't, we don't have to argue about racism anymore, but I think we still have to have these conversations and they need to be robust. But what, what things do you think we could do? And that's some masterclass stuff right there. And I guess we don't even use that word anymore, which is a good thing. <laughs> so <laughs> when y'all want to answer like ways that we can continue to engage people, I know in the education system, it's always going to be good to, to bring in books and in places like Portland and Oregon, really, I think that we're too, we're like Georgia. We don't want people to see us that way. So it'd be a harder fight, but for people in Texas that are banning books already and and getting rid of principles and things of that sort. What are some thoughts that y'all might have and as parents, as community members, doesn't have to be from legal. Um, I, I tend to, to still believe in education being um, the only way we're, we can dig ourselves out of this. Um, and in true to any kind of education, it requires patience, requires forgivingness, and uh, an understanding that not everybody is coming from the same, starting at the same place in un understanding these concepts or understanding their own privilege. And, um, you know, as, as a lot of people are traveling home to, to see family throughout the, the holiday season, um, you know, again, speaking to, to kind of like protest tolerance and, and understanding your own limitations, um, it's unfortunately, I think the only way we'll get through this is 
um, winning over the people who aren't on our side yet. And I, I don't mean to say that, uh, you know, become necessarily buddy buddy with your, with uh, the family member who's, who's uh, generally terrible. But, um, you know, I'll say that I, for instance, uh, again, going back to the prison context, um, I represent people of all, of all sorts who are being um, oppressed by the state, injured by the state, denied medical care, thrown into solitary confinement, what have you. Not once has anybody asked me what I think about critical race theory. They're just grateful that I'm helping them. Um, and I think for a lot of folks that is, in, you know, for better or worse, I, I, I might be the, the first lawyer who has more than an hour to talk to them about <laughs> what's going on in their lives. And I, 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 I'm not trying to pat ourselves on the back or anything, but it, it is just being there for people, showing solidarity, showing that you have their back and you're not trying to rob them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think that's 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 my uh, channeling Gandalf, not, not anything else. But um, I think I think it's that kind of compassion that that will sway people. Um, so, do you think the, do you think vulnerable communities need to get more of a stake in that educational access for it? Like, do we? How do we? You know, like those people that just want you to help them. Um, a lot of times when I used to go back and forth to McLaren, we would engage the youth and say, hey, y'all have so much time, get this information and then share it with people that are outside that think they're busy. You know, like when you talk to your family, start bringing up these different circumstances that you're researching and that you're learning about, because we'll be out there trying to engage them. And when you talk to them and you're on that same page, I think we as a society, and I'm not talking about the, the part of the society that doesn't like us, but we, the people that are vulnerable in society, will have more power if we're educating ourselves and we're, you know, participating in this together. What are your, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And, you know, obviously. <laughs> Just uh, briefly, then I'll hand it off to Ashley. You know, I think people genuinely respond positively to our, to somebody's enthusiasm. You know, I, uh, I don't think people necessarily like being lectured to. I don't think people necessarily like being, feel like they're being punished. I mean, again, kind of going to the misinterpretation of what CRT is, you know, these uh, Karens going to a school board meetings saying my child now thinks that he's supposed to hate him, hate themselves for being white or what have you. That I, a, that's probably a lie. B, <laughs> um, you know, I, I would say that I don't think people are necessarily doing that, but again, I, I, it speaks to what I think people interpret CRT to be doing, when in fact, I think it is compassionate, it is utopian, it is about building the society that we want to actually, that, that we actually deserve. And I think people should get, can, can get behind an enthusiastic, joyful uh, uh, construct like that. And if it's just reading a book, <laughs> a banned book. <laughs> Ashley, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I echo all that. And I think um, one of the one of the reasons why I'm so appreciative of Don't Shoot is that the work that y'all do is grounded in love. And, you know, in a lot of legal spaces, we don't talk about love, <laughs> right? We don't use that word. Um, but I do think it is a love of humanity, a love of our you know, the fellow travelers on this planet at this moment um, and looking to each other for solidarity and support. And I think, um, you know, something Juan just said that also really resonated is like, if we, you know, I think critical race theory is really looking at these structures with the goal of making a more equitable society. Um, most people that I know that I've talked to don't want to be a part of a system that rests on the exploitation of others. And yet that's the system we're in. And I think when you really drill down into that, those fundamental concepts, like, you know, we could all switch depending on what your spiritual beliefs are, but we could be in any other body. We could be in any other lump of meat um, at any moment. And so recognizing the shared humanity that we have um, and, and acknowledging that we don't want to be a part of a system that like requires the exploitation of others. Um, that like most people really do agree with that. And then, then you can talk about dismantling capitalism, but like when you're talking about that, just in the, in the fundamental sense of, of 
of humanity and and you know everyone has someone that they love or loves them and so we can relate to each other in that way um i do think that's a big piece of this um and i think that critical race theory like you know the the ways that it has changed the legal teaching the way that we teach new lawyers how to be i think that has influenced that maybe not overtly and Juan and i can probably really drill down into this and i'm sure there's a lot of other people in our community that can speak to this um, far better than i but i do think it has um influenced how law schools teach now and a lot of students have demanded that curriculum have demanded this this kind of um, analysis as part of the, the way that they're being taught and I think that that's a direct legacy of organizing and activism and critical race theory, identifying a different way to teach that information. Um, and I think that also tri not trickles down because I don't want to say down, um, but it also has you know showed up in in the type of information that is being taught to children now. And like I have a ton of books in my house too that I love reading, that I love engaging with my kids on, that I want to pass on to everyone. And I think there's all different ways. Um, and there's um, more material out there for me as a parent to engage with my kids around racism and white supremacy. And that's not a word they would blink at anymore. Um, whereas I don't think I even heard that word until I was in college. Um, so I think that the, the organizing work that's being done around anti-oppression and around anti-racism has really shifted the, the um, field, not as far as it needs to go. And that's why there's still work to do. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of hope in the way that we engage with each other and the joy that we bring to it. I agree with all of that, what both of you said. And I'm so happy to just know you and to be able to work with you and to be able to show up for our community um, with people that I trust and love. You know, like I, I really, I stand for y'all. Y'all know that um, even before we had the capacity to bring forth lawsuits, just knowing that you were out there with us while we're on the front line gave me an extra added protection because I knew that there were people that really in their minds didn't understand why we were there. But to me, y'all understood because you had education um, in this legal system. And I don't think I'll ever call the justice system the justice system again after your def uh, you know, your description of it because that makes more sense. It is a legal system. It gets so hard to call it unjust when we know that it's just legal. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was a lot. I'm like literally thankful. Um, yeah, people need to be more engaged. We shouldn't be afraid of things that are being banned. We should be, you know, courageous in, in getting opportunities to teach our children through education, literature, art, um, through activism, even if it's not frontline activism, but just being engaged in the world, I think creates character and substance for us to become better people and to show up different um, in our world for each other. And I wanted to go ahead and have Karen come back because we wanna go ahead and get the answers to CRT. We know what it's not <laughs> and we kind of know what it is, but we're gonna go ahead and, and participate with these seven um, and I'm gonna get Karen back on as a host real quick because I know that needs to happen. Let's see. Why am I having such a hard time today with everything, Ty? Yeah, I, think, <laughs> I think it should work. Do, do you see the, the screen? Oh now? yeah, you're on there okay. with me already. Okay. 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 Super. That was me. Yeah, that's yeah. Karen's screen. I thought um, I was stuff up. I, I just want to say that was such a fantastic conversation to listen to. So thank you all. Um, okay, so just a, um, a reminder that the questions presented are from the Reuters Ipsos poll from July 2021. Um, you know, and for anyone who missed this in the beginning, it was this, uh, for the survey, a sample of 1,004 adults age 18 plus from the continental US, Alaska, and Hawaii was interviewed online in English. Um, the poll has a credibility interval of plus or minus 3.5 percentage points for all respondents. So the first question, um, you know, um, true or false, CRT is taught in most public high schools. The answer is false. Whoops, do you see my screen? Yeah, okay. 55% um, so all of this data is from the poll and We'll put the link, um, you know, in the chat 
after this, 55% of the total respondents didn't know the answer. And of the total respondents, 15% um, Democrats, 17% Republicans, and 16% independents believed this to be true. Question number two, um, CRT was first established 40 years ago. I think there's like a lag in my internet. Do you see the next screen? Um, it's still on number two. Um, it's, it's acting slow for some reason. The answer is true. And actually, um, okay. Uh, so 74% of the total respondents didn't know this answer. Question three, CRT says that individual acts or laws are unlikely to change systems that were founded with racist principles. The answer is true. 53% of the total respondents didn't know the answer. Question number four, CRT says that many American institutions are founded on racist principles. The answer is true. 42% of the total respondents didn't know the answer. Question number five, um, CRT says that many American institutions are set up to favor white Americans. The answer is true. And from the poll, 42% of the total respondents didn't know the answer. Question six, are the following statements about um, CRT true or false? CRT says that discriminating against white people is the only way to achieve equality. The answer is false. 46% of the total respondents didn't know the answer. Um, from the 20% of total respondents, 16% Democrats, 31% Republicans, and 13% 13% independents believe this to be true. And the last question, CRT, CRT says that white people are inherently bad or evil. The answer is false. 43% of the total respondents didn't know the answer. 22% of the total respondents, so that's 14% Democrats, 34% Republicans, 24% independents believe this to be true. So um, those, those were just seven of the questions. And um, you know, from the original article, um, only 5% of the um, people surveyed correctly answered all seven true or false questions. And um, only 32% correctly answered more than four of the seven questions. And there were, there were a bunch of other questions in the poll and so, it's, it's actually um, an interesting document. So we'll share that link. I'm so glad that you did that. How many of y'all um, on this Zoom actually took the, the test while she was going through those? How many did you get right? All of them, okay. <laughs> what about you, Juan? Did you take the test? <laughs> Thank you. A rare A plus for me too. So. <laughs> Well, were you surprised that the people polled um, 
the way that the polling numbers showed up, did, were you surprised by that information? Yeah, I got to say, I was looking at those and the independence ones um, were kind of, I would love to look at that a little bit more. And I'm excited to look at the link just because, you know, the independent had a couple unexpected percentages from what I had thought it would be. Some of the ones with the, you know, that white people are people that didn't really surprise me, but I'm surprised at how many people got it completely wrong. And then on the other hand, I'm not that surprised because there has been a really strong effort to just really demonize this notion of critical race theory and misstate what it is and um, mischaracterize it in order to sow this kind of um, anti-critical race theory, like calling, teaching about racism racist is really bananas. And like I said before, it would be laughable if it wasn't so insidious. <laughs> well, that's why I thought it was important for us to have this discussion because there's so much misinformation that's out there. Um, Karen put a link in the chat so that you can check out the rest of the information. Juan, what were your thoughts about those polling numbers? <laughs> education. <laughs> we need <Karen>. more education. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Um, yeah. Well, I hope that both of you are able to get information from that link and share it with your colleagues and make it a trend for people to get engaged, because I think the more we we connect with it rather than run away from it or or just ignore it, the better we are as, um, you know, as organizers, as people that are trying to lead us towards change. Um, <laughs> Karen, what, what were your thoughts? I'm, I'm so curious also to the process of bringing that together with our installation. Um, and if you don't mind sharing, like what was your inspiration for connecting us with this kind of um, product or pamphlet information when you saw the, the, art, the art? Yeah, um, you know, <laughs> as, when, when you first shared the documents that you wanted, um, you know, to wallpaper the gallery space, just seeing it, you know, it's, you can't, like, I couldn't help but make connections, like, okay, like, you know, here's this petition saying, you know, people don't want people living in this area, and housing is, you know, like, I think you can ask almost any parent who's a homeowner, why did you pick the home that you live in? It's usually because of the schools or, you know, there are so many connections and, you know, in, in the research for this booklet, there was an article that we found that talked, it was an interview with the author of this book, Race for Profit, How Banks and the Real Estate Industry Undermined Black Home Ownership. Um, and, you know, just this idea of like home ownership creating generational wealth and, there are just so many ways everything connects. And so, you know, I, I, I totally agree too with what um, everyone was talking about. Like education is, is just so important. And, and this idea of like, of, you know, the, you know, documents, you know, being proof of, of a part of history that people might not talk about. You know, there was a Times article um, in January, 2020 that, I couldn't believe it was, you know, it showed um, comparisons between textbooks in California and Texas, like social study textbooks, and it had them side to side, showing how it's two education systems in terms of, t you know, talking about what has happened in our country, and and so you know, and that's that's how it has been, and so I just think of, um, sorry, I went off track, <laughs> but. You know, I, th I think of, um, you know, just this idea that education is so important because it's also how you teach empathy and how you, you know, learn how to to move forward. Um, so, you know, this morning there was um, a Times opinion piece that has just been really sticking in my mind. Um, it was actually about the, the pillar of shame um, being removed at Hong Kong University, but, um, I just find the quote, I, I didn't actually know that um, there was a quote at the base of the sculpture, but the words engraved at the bottom are, the old cannot kill the young forever. And I just thought it was really interesting. Thank you so much. What a great way to go out today. Like, wow, Karen. 
Like if it couldn't have got any better, um, this was a wonderful day to have this conversation. Um, we had our little technical difficulties, but the conversation and what we all shared is so essential in our community today. And I hope that the people that get to watch this live and the ones that, um, that check out the recording, um, that they are inspired to have these conversations, to build these conversations, to use the foundation of art and whatever you're doing in society to connect the dots of humanity, because we're trying, we're all trying and we're getting somewhere. And even if it doesn't feel like it, um, we always have tomorrow. Um, we can always continue striving. And so do your best every day. Um, thank you everybody. Black Lives Matter, not Black Friday. I appreciate you, Ashley, Karen, and Juan. I appreciate you, Ty, for your technical assistance and Mishana for being quiet over here while we do our little, you know, our community organizing online. I'm just thankful. And so thank you all for your friendship also. Have a great weekend. See y'all later. Thank you. Thank you.